and I get down to Buenos Aires and of course the franchisee had gone through training and we had a menu and specifications and equipment that they were supposed to have for the business. And I, I get down there and they had done everything we told them, bought all the kitchen equipment, almost identical menu as in the US. And as we started training the cooks, it became apparent that there was a problem. They were um, disgruntled. They were saying, you know, like, this food is bad and I can't believe we have to do this. And at first I was like, what's going on? And then I realized by talking to the cooks and the trainers that we had brought down that Argentina, I would then learn, is the beef capital, one of the beef capitals of the world. And we had an embarrassingly low quality ribeye steak sandwich that we were requiring them to cook on a flat top grill, which was an abomination in Argentina. In the US, if you want a steak sandwich, take a ribeye, you slap it on a flat top grill, a little bit of olive oil, sear it, how do you want it cooked? Medium, medium well, put it on your Texas toast sandwich with some cheese and onions, and there you go. It, it, was, it was so viewed as so low quality that it was insulting there. Not only the choice of the, the beef, which should have been alternatively hyper local source to be of the quality that is expected even in casual dining there. Right. It was the equipment. It was that it wasn't on open flame. And I remember that fork in the road where I thought, what do I do? I'm here representing the company. These are the franchise standards. They clearly signed up for it. They bought it. It's here. Do I just toe the line and say, nope, sorry. This is the menu. Get over it. Or do I listen and take that feedback and make a decision to change? Kat, I'm so happy to have you on the show. I'm so excited to be here. I was trying to think about where to start this, and I think a good place to start is the dark side of gratitude. What does that expression mean to you, and where does it come from? Yeah, I. it's funny. I'm definitely known for leading with gratitude, so it's an ironic statement from someone like me. But I remember when my mom came to me when I was nine years old and said, you know, that's it. I'm done. We're leaving. And what she meant was we were leaving my dad. Uh, my dad was and is a very good man, but at the time was an alcoholic and he had a wife and three young daughters at home, nine, me, six and three, my two sisters. And I had been in multiple car accidents with him, um, drunk driving by the time I was nine. And so I remember when my mom came to me and said we were leaving, I did not cry. I did not get upset. I looked at her at the age of nine and said, what took you so long? And, and it was because I was close enough to the bad to realize that even a scary decision was a better one than the alternative, which was staying. But as I got older and I talked to my mom more about that decision, which turned out great for everyone, um, I asked her again, what took you so long? Because she started sharing with me how bad it was for how long. And, and what it boiled down to was the dark side of gratitude, that she was so grateful that she had a nice house. And she was so grateful that uh, we had gifts for the holidays. And she was told by her family and my father's family and her friends who were very poor, much more so than us, we would be considered middle class at that stage, that she was lucky to have all these things that she had and that that was a, a, the alcoholism and the things that came along with it were a small price to pay for those other, what appeared to be fortunes. And to me, it seemed that that was the perfect example of the dark side of gratitude, that sometimes we can be so humble, so grateful for what we have, that we forget that we have the right, and in the case of being a leader or a parent, the responsibility to work toward something better. And so I, I am a, an, an intense gratitudist and lead with gratitude, but I have personally lived 
that we can be so grateful that we forget to look around at the opportunity and the responsibilities we may have for something better. You also believe in people. And I thought that this was interesting. You called yourself a positive, uh, no, it was an optimistic, what was the, the term you used? Uh, I, I've used a few terms, but uh, either a pragmatic optimist or an optimistic optimist. pragmatist or a practical yeah. optimist, you know, any of those things that don't seem to belong together. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting because uh, I also uh, sort of like by default believe in people and sometimes it comes with a cost and, mm -hmm. um, you know, you called it a tax earlier. I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I really do believe humans are mostly magic and that that we are all just unfinished magic and we're more likely to be the fullest extent of our magic if other people see us that way first. And um, I've certainly learned that when I see people for their potential and their possibilities, that they seem to live up to that more quickly than when they interact with others. And I have felt that benefit of being looked at as my potential and felt the need and the ability and desire to grow into that. So the, the upside of believing in people is so high and not but, and some will let us down. And the frequency that I'm let down is so low compared to the frequency that I'm proven right in people's potential. And so it just feels like this tax. It's like a single digit percentage tax that is a small price to pay for getting all the upside that comes from looking at people as the, the great things that they are and the possibilities that they have in front of them. I find you often get what you put out into the world, but mm. we have this almost lost aversion, right? You're walking down the street and you smile at somebody and, you know, 95 times out of 100, they'll smile back at you or at least have no response. But 5% of the time they'll scowl. And so we don't do it because of that 5% of the time. And then we forfeit. And that's the tax, I think, in, in your case. And then we forfeit the 95% of the time where it works out massively better. Yeah, I think... I think math is our friend here that, you know, 5% of trying something only 10 times feels like such a heavy tax, but 5% on smiling a thousand times in the scheme of things feels so worth it. One of the stories that you told that I really want to make sure that we draw out when you mentioned um, the positive intent before was about chicken wings <laughs> and <laughs> I love this story. So I'm going to get you, get you to I've only it told it once. Start. Yeah. So I, I, I want to hear this story again. I think everybody will benefit from this. Yeah. So I was a waitress uh, at Hooters it was my third job and, and I, I loved it. I had so much fun and I, I had many experiences where I realized I had the ability to, see a bigger picture, be creative in my approaches when there were challenging situations and customers. In this one particular circumstance, there was a customer uh, that started coming in with some friends every Friday, and he would order 50 chicken wings, which is one giant plate of a mountain of saucy chicken wings, and a couple pitchers of beer for he and his friends. And he would eat them all, they would eat them all, and then call one of us over, the waitress at the time, and say, excuse me, there were only 40 wings here and you need to take it off my bill or give us a discount. And imagine being the waitress, someone is telling you that a 50 wings that were supposed to be there that are, are now a plate of bones were not 50, were 40. And, and I remember thinking, what do I do in this moment? Because if there were only you know, if there were only 40, maybe we screwed it up. So having that default of, yeah, okay, that can happen. But then he did it again the next Friday and again the next Friday. And it became apparent that this was either a game or a scheme to get a discount. And so instead of fighting with him, which some managers and servers were starting to do, because there's no way that was happening so consistently to only right. him on a shift, um, instead of fighting with him, I just decided before they finished the plate of 50 wings, I rang up and with my employee discount, a plate of 10 wings uh, on my own, had the kitchen produce that, and before they were finished, brought them a plate of 10 wings. 
and smiled and said, I'm sure we got it right this time. I'm sure there's at least 50 here. And his friends, who clearly knew he was being a bit of a difficult customer, all laughed and like, oh, she got you, man. And and it was the first time someone didn't fight him. It was almost like customer service judo, where I was using his energy in a way to play the game back to him, but in a giving way. And uh, he never complained again, and he gave me a really big tip. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I bet you that changed the behavior. Yeah. Who was the first person to ever bet on you? Wow. Um, I would say my mom, maybe by default, I had to watch the girls. I was nine years old, and she was working three jobs. She fed us on a food budget of $10 a week for three years, uh, which meant she wasn't home. Uh, a lot. And so she trusted me. Again, the degree to which she had to versus having a choice can be debated, but it felt like trust. Um, and it felt like she was making a bet on me. And she would give me a list of things to do at home, and I would get most of them done <laughs> with the girls. And so I think she was really the first person to bet on me. Outside of my mom, what feels like the first person to bet on me was Bonnie who was the person who hired me at Hooters. She hired me as a 17 year old hostess uh, and she was the general manager at the store. She herself had been a waitress, a Hooters girl and moved her way up to running the restaurant. And she is the one who gave me the ability to move into being a waitress. And she's the one that came to me when the corporate office called and said, we're looking for really great employees to travel around the world to go launch the franchise. And, and maybe as importantly, she's the first person to call me out and treat me like an adult. I was working three jobs in the early days and I was late pretty often because I was working three jobs and it was impossible to juggle getting from one place to the other given the shift time. And she sat me down and said, hey, before you check out today, I need to talk to you in the office. It was very simple not really overly emotive. And she said, look, you're great with your peers. I'll never forget it. I remember the exact words. You're great with your peers. I'd love to give you more shifts. I would love to give you more opportunities, but I depend on you showing up on time. And if you're late, other people have to stay later. And I need to know that I can depend on you. And if this isn't a, enough of a priority for you, that's okay. We can scale back your shifts uh, or you can quit and work other jobs, but I need to know where you are on this. And it was the first time, I was 18, and it was the first time that I really felt like an adult, like a working adult. It was just a job. You know, these were just jobs up to that point. And she so skillfully, with so few words, said so much. You know, this is what your job is. I'm reinforcing what my job is to run this ship. Other people are affected by your decisions. And it. I quit my other two jobs uh, after that. Did you feel that instantly or did you have to go away and think about it or instantly, instantly it made me, it was not only so clear that I was making it difficult for other people and whether she said that, um, coincidentally, or she had learned what made me tick <laughs> because few things make me feel worse than the idea of letting someone down. And so that hit me really hard and it made me want to work for her. You know, I, I loved her before, she was a great leader, but that conversation made me want to work for her exclusively. So it was it was immediate. So I think it's a good time to sort of pause and just give us a thumbnail sketch of um, your career. I mean, it's very narrative defying in a lot of ways. A lot of people work in hospitality, but not a lot of people have the trajectory that you had at such a young age. Can you walk us through some of your experiences and how we got here today <laughs> before we go on? Yeah. Um, so started working when I was 15, sold clothes in malls. I then started at Hooters at the age of 17 as a hostess. First person in my family to get accepted to college. Uh, became a waitress at 18 my senior year. Uh, then started college and kept waitressing. But then I also started cooking. The cooks quit one day and I ended up picking up kitchen shifts. And then another day, uh, the bartender had to go home and she needed one of the servers to help her uh, take over the shift. And so these things kept happening in the business that resulted in me working different jobs. And before I was 19, 
And before I even finished my first year in college, I had worked every job in that business. I knew how to run a restaurant without realizing I knew how to run a restaurant. But that was not my ambition. My ambition was to get my degree. I was a electrical engineering and computer sciences major, a psychology of women minor, and my plan was to get those degrees and go to law school. I thought I would be an attorney. And by the time I was 19, what I mentioned before with this story with Bonnie, she came to me and said, you know how to do every job in this building. I trust you. I know you'll represent us well. Uh, I'd like to nominate you to be a part of the training team to go launch the first ever Hooters franchise in Australia. I was 19 years old. I had never been on a plane. I had only been out of the state of Florida twice in my life for cheerleading competitions, and I did not have a passport. Yet I still said yes uh, immediately. No question, no doubt. Yes, I want to go to Australia and help launch a franchise, even though I have no idea what that means. I bought my first ever plane ticket that night to fly to Miami, stand in line with my paperwork, get my passport expedited so I could legally exit the country and commit to what I had just committed to. Flew to Sydney, helped open that franchise, came back, uh, was there for 40 days, came back, made up my classes that I missed and thought that was it. I just thought I was back on the path I was on. This was just a very interesting experience and diversion. And 60 days later, the company reached out and said, we're bringing the brand to, to Mexico, the first in Central America. We want the best team possible to be put together. Will you be on that team? And I said, yes. And this started to repeat itself every few months until one, I was leading the teams very quickly before I was 20 years old. I was no longer a member of the team. I was now going early, setting up the supply chain, getting things ready, managing and leading the team, getting the restaurant open, staying longer. Um, and coming back, and I was failing college because I was never there. So at the age of 20, after having opened seven restaurants on um, three separate continents outside of North America, I dropped out of college. Um, really, I was I failed. <laughs> I failed out of college, um, but I made that choice to not double down and make up all the things I'd missed. And that was when I was 20. And luckily, a few months later, I was offered a corporate job in Atlanta, uh, moved from Jacksonville, Florida to Atlanta to take a corporate gig as a 20 year old running the employee training department. And the really fast version of what happened from there is as the company grew, I grew. By the time I was 26, I was one of the vice presidents of the company. We were doing 800 million in revenue. I remained an executive taking uh, increasing responsibility over a period of six years, staying with Hooters for a total of 15 years, and then was recruited to go work in private equity, ended up running a private equity portfolio company called Cinnabon, helped turn it around out of the recession, built that team, got it growing for four years. Then again, as the company grew, I grew, became group president of the company, launched the CPG omni-channel manufacturing and e-com division for all the brands. Uh, and then a few years into that, uh, rolled it all up together and I became president and COO of Focus Brands, which I just left nine weeks ago. And in that role, I had nine presidents reporting to me, seven, over 7,000 locations, uh, eight brands under that portfolio, like Cinnabon and Auntie Anne's and Jamba Juice and more, and uh, loved it, you know, ran, ran the business and had an incredible, incredible ride there. So that's the history up to up to nine weeks ago. Perfect. There's so many places I want to dive in. Let's start with uh, when you're 19. Where did that confidence come from to do something you've never done before? It was this, this type of confidence that I, I hope to see more of in the world. It, it will be more of what I talk about, um, will be in a book from me one day, but it's a humble confidence. It, I never thought I knew what I was doing. Never. Not once did I think, yes, I'm going to do that because I know what I'm doing. What I thought was, I can figure it out. And that is an important distinction that this set of mindsets of humility and curiosity on one side, courage and confidence on the other, and any of them unchecked without the others have typically been the source of my greatest mistakes. Um, but it was, a, it was just this humble confidence. I knew I could figure it out. I knew I would be comfortable asking questions. I also didn't expect greatness from, <laughs> from myself. You know, I just, I thought it would be interesting. And the idea of saying no felt so much more painful 
than the idea of saying yes and screwing up. Is that what you mean by uh, the term I think you used in another interview is the hustle muscle? Yeah, the hustle muscle for me, what hustle muscle is not, is it's not um, work yourself into the into the ground and everything's about work. Hustle muscle for me is that on one side there's say yes before you're ready, which I clearly subscribe to that <laughs> approach. But if you only say yes before you're ready and then you don't actually do the work to fill the gap that is created because you're new, then you're letting people down. You're saying yes to something and you're actually not delivering the return on that investment in you that someone else that is more experienced otherwise would. And so hustle muscle is say yes before you're ready, but then do the work, do the research, ask for help, be willing to put in the hours, whatever it takes so that people say, ah, I took a bet on you, uh, I took a chance on you, and you're not perfect, and you probably screw things up, but I want you on my teams again. You know, that's a that's what I was going for. One of the other things that I, I think you went through is one day you're, um, you're a part of a team, the next day you're leaving that team, and that's a really difficult transition for a lot of people to make. Can you walk mm -hmm. me through some of the mistakes you made or some of the lessons you learned taking over so quickly? S so many mistakes. I have a master's in mistakes, <laughs> I like to say. <laughs> I think um, we both do. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's the, the situation is I travel to a country. I, I meet the team that I'm leading for the first time, these trainers that are coming from other places all around the world, just like I did at one time. And we have to introduce ourselves, be very clear about what we're there to do. Some people have opened restaurants before, others had not develop trust, get into uh, the workflow in a country where the brand has never been, with a franchisee who's never operated the business, with customers that have never experienced the concept. And so it's this unknown team in unknown country, often unfamiliar language, which is a whole nother layer of dynamics. And yet we have to get a job done. And the the mistakes I made, I'm so lucky because the mistakes I made became obvious very quickly. Uh, because after opening in Australia and then Mexico and Argentina and the Bahamas and Salt Lake City, Utah, it became apparent that if there was a pattern of problems, I was the only common denominator. And so leading businesses with different teams frequently is one of the most brutal yet beautiful leadership mirrors. You cannot deny that if something is consistently going wrong, that it is very likely your fault. And I, I realized that uh, in Sydney, there was something that went wrong with the training schedule. There was a particular point in the employee training schedule that was clunky and difficult and new hires were confused. They didn't know where to go. And I remember in that opening, I thought, oh, it's because the franchisee is new. You know, I made it about everybody else. It's because they don't understand how this works here. And then I got to Mexico and something very similar happened like this point in the training schedule it was the friends and family day and it was actually a little bit of a confusing schedule where you you work during the day and the people who aren't working come with their friends and family and then the people who dined uh for this practice shift come at night and then the people who work during the day come and bring their friends and family and it was became apparent once i got to argentina that i was doing a very bad job explaining what this is, what they needed to know, creating systems for them to sign up and explain to their friends and family what this even was. And it took three or four openings for me to realize this is my fault. I am not articulating something in a way that makes it easy for people to fully engage and participate. And the minute I realized that, I spent the time to put together printed documents, have pre-meetings, have people ask questions in a pre-pre-shift, and what do you know? miraculously at that next opening, it was flawless. And, and I had many of those occurrences and realizations. And I do think that's because I was comfortable paying attention. I, I genuinely cared so much about people's experience. I didn't want it to be crappy. I didn't want them to be confused. It made work harder on all of us when people showed up and didn't know what was going on. And that embarrassed me as a leader. And so maybe it was because I, I have ego and I didn't want to be embarrassed or uh, because I care so much about them having a great experience that I actually did pay attention to when things were uh, had friction and assumed 
first that it had something to do with my lack of leadership, my um, lack of being seasoned in these roles and sought out the opportunities to get better pretty regularly. But I have a long list of those types of things that that happened. Are there other transitions that you had into new roles that were um, particularly tough or tougher than others? And which were they and what happened? There are two things that I think have made every new role I've taken um, full of my most epic mistakes. one is that I'm often moving from peer to leader. And and that's because I haven't hopped around to a lot of companies. So I'm literally moving up, leading within a company. I'm being chosen to level up and lead those with whom I have just worked side by side. And what's hard about that is none of us, you know, we're not perfect. And so all of a sudden when someone is plucked out of the peer group to be a leader, then everything that you have done not perfectly becomes um, an excuse for others to not do it perfectly. And so I have been regularly confronted with my imperfections um, almost on a, like a constant basis. People saying, well, how can you ask me to do this if you didn't do it yourself? And over time, that made me a better contributor as an employee because I recognize there are many reasons to do the job the right way, not the least of which is I'm probably going to end up being their leader and I want to set a good example. Um, and, and that I recognize that great leaders can find a way to help people realize why they should be doing their best, their best work. And so that being confronted with my own imperfections as a peer caused me to level up faster, but it also caused me to experience a lot of conflict in each each time I was promoted because it's natural. Other people think, well, why, why wasn't I promoted? Or how is she going to tell us to do these things that she herself didn't do well? So that was just constant friction, you know, every time I got, I, I was promoted. But the other reason that I had these epic mistakes and, and one example that's coming to mind in particular is there is a reason often that uh, someone is hiring a new person into a job. They want change. So I'm taking over a job or a role or creating a new role because the company needs change. And that means doing new things. And by definition, if it's new, the company's systems are not built for it. Innovation always outpaces the corporation and regulation. And I am typically taking over a role that demands innovation. And I remember distinctly when I became president of Cinnabon, I was 31 years old as COO, 32 when I became uh, president of the company. It was in 2010, the heart of the recession, and the business was exclusively, almost exclusively in malls and airports. So just a lot of challenges from a demand perspective, top line sales um, had been depressed for several years, starting to kind of get the business below break even. And these are small independently owned franchise businesses. And again, in malls. So just a really difficult time. This was before the, whatever you want to call the retail apocalypse or e-com boom. It was just a function of people not having a lot of discretionary income and pulling back from shopping and traveling. In addition, the brand had not been really invested in from a a brick and mortar standpoint or innovation because it was so beloved. It was in this situation that many brands get in that in an effort to protect what has made it special, um, that love for the past becomes an anchor. You know, it becomes weights around the the business's ankles. So I was inheriting all of these dynamics at once. A brand that was trying to protect protect its legacy to its own detriment, uh, an economic condition that was causing top line sales um, to decline, and then independent business owners that were not well capitalized enough to weather this storm. Some people are like, why did you take that job? And I just, it was like shining a light in the dark. It's like only up to go from here. And when I took over that business, I did a few things really well, um, working very closely at the unit level, staying close to the employees, listening to customers, understanding what the brick and mortar business needed. But one of the innovations I and we leaned into was launching an omni-channel business, really leaning into licensing grocery and CPG. And some of that business was already there, but it was very single note. And it was clear that if the business took 25 years 
to get to a thousand units. I didn't have another 25 years to get to another thousand points of distribution. And so we leaned into alternative channels, licensed partnerships, developing versions of our product, co-manufacturing it with other producers and getting it to market with other distributors and putting it in the hands of other retailers like grocery stores. And when I joined, there was an existing product being developed for one of these alternative channels. And the, the short version of a long and interesting story is that I told the franchisees about the product based on what I was told. And the reality was that it was turning in parallel path to a different product that would become at least optically very competitive with the franchisees products. And it looked like I had lied. So I go to the franchisees, I say, we're about to launch X product with Costco. And then a few days later, Y product shows up in Costco and it looks eerily similar to what they sell for half the price. And they felt lied to, they felt that it was an exa another example of a corporation uh, capitalizing on the backs of these small struggling franchisees. And, and I really do believe outside of losing life and losing love, there is nothing worse than losing trust. And in an instant, after months of building their confidence and them believing that I would be the right leader for the right time, who really understood their business and their customers, that trust was gone. And I had to clean up a big mess that I created. And, and what was at work was the dark side of humility that I thought when I joined the company, I saw some of these things going on and I thought, who am I to question them? I respect these people so much. They've been in business as long as I've been alive or longer. Who am I to question these very mature, very seasoned people? I had the humility to ask that question. In that moment, I failed to have the courage to answer it. And the answer was, I am the president. And if I don't ask questions, no one will. And had I asked the questions that I definitely had in the back of my mind, I could have disrupted that chain of events, realized it was going in a direction that would need to be managed differently, and had the outcome be maybe still uncomfortable for the franchisees, but protect our relationship, the trust and the confidence. And so that now I'm in a position to clean up this mess that yes, was a result of things in place before I got there, but absolutely was only able to become the mess that it did because I did not fully take up the space that my role demanded. Luckily, we have very high integrity owners. And when I came to them and said, we had the right to do this legally, but we didn't handle it the right way. Uh, the, the product just moved at a much faster pace than our existing systems were structured to catch. And uh, we, we killed the initiative. We walked away from millions, millions in EBITDA. It was devastating for the company and the budget, but it was the only option to preserve the relationship with my franchisees with whom I needed to build the business for many years to come. And a funny thing happens when you do the right thing for the right reasons. Just a few months later, we had the opportunity to put uh, an even more optically competitive product, a mini bond in 7,000 Burger Kings. And when I went to the franchisees now with better systems and better communication to tell them about this opportunity, while they didn't love it, they said, because of how you handled Costco, we trust you. And that single opportunity by multiples grew the EBITDA of the company. And I was able to take revenue from that innovation channel and invest it in the core brick and mortar business to accelerate the franchisee's recovery in addition to the business growth they got from the marketing of that initiative. So very painful time. I was in tears you know, every night during that time, um, but it, my, my reaction to it became legend in the company as an example of high integrity. Talk to me about that board conversation. How did <laughs> that go? Because uh, you're also, you're on one hand saying, this is the only way I can be a higher integrity leader. On the other hand, you're saying, we're going to walk away from potentially business saving uh, revenue. It's even in the moment, I realized how fortunate I was to be working with such a high integrity CEO and private equity firm because the board conversation was not difficult. It was difficult for me because I was sad and embarrassed, but it wasn't a fight. 
Um, it was first the conversation with the CEO of the parent company to let him know what was going on. And that was probably the most painful of the conversations. He's such uh, a legend in the industry and so pro franchisee that I knew this would not only anger him deeply, but it would break his heart and it would embarrass him as well. And that, that crushed me to have that conversation. And so I said, here's what happened. Here's how it happened. Here's what I think we should do about it. And he was livid. Um, not necessarily at me, but that the systems that were in place didn't catch this, that, that we had leaned in so fast to an innovation channel that we didn't have the, the maturity to pause and really think through the impact on the legacy business, probably in excitement for how, growth, uh, how high growth this innovation business was going to be. So p past the emotional side of it with him, he said, I agree, I support you. We're going to have to talk to the board. And he proactively gave the board a heads up. And then I had the conversation with them. And it was quite easy. It was, look, we're in a very long turnaround. This business didn't get this way overnight. It's going to be a long journey. You are ex the board, this private equity firm, Rourke, they're experts in franchising. So they get this deeply. It would have been a much tougher conversation if it were just a typical financial sponsor, I think. Uh, but because they understand the strength of the business model is franchising and franchisees, it's this 20 year annuity and marriage that I don't think it was a difficult conversation, but it was disappointing. And um, they, I, there were just a few pushes, right? How are you gonna make sure this doesn't happen again? Are you going to communicate it in a way that makes it clear that you're not just responding to something people don't like because the legacy business never likes innovation. Uh, how are you gonna manage this beast that you might be creating by quote, giving them what they want. And I just said that that's my job, right? You're hiring me to, to manage this brand and this business and return it to growth. I'm telling you, I can't do that unless we correct this issue. And here are the other channels we are going to continue to pursue. Uh, but that again, can only happen on the foundation of trust. And so they certainly pushed because they were concerned there might be some unwieldy systems underneath that could cause future circumstances that are similar. But once they got comfortable with my answer and my commitment to not wanting to be in this situation, again, they were fully supportive. Talk to me about how you message that to the franchisees, because on one hand, you, you don't want to signal that if you, mm. you know, you whine, you get your way. <laughs> and you were legally able to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious how that the tension between those, those things went with the franchisees. Yeah, it, your question reminds me of this phrase, which is, it's rarely about the event. It's almost always about the event after the event, like every moment leaves a thumbprint. And I was really conscious that however this communicate, however this was communicated, however this was delivered was going to leave a belief system in their minds. But still, because I had fractured their trust, that concern, although real of creating a monster and having them get what they want was not the biggest problem. Like it was real, but the biggest problem was repairing the trust. And I would rather err on the side of creating a little bit of a demanding monster on a basis of trust, then be so cautious that I don't feed their uh, demands that, that I don't fully repair the trust. That was very clear to me. And so um, I think they could feel that when I had the conversation with them, first was letting them yell and cuss and be angry and threaten with lawyers and just hearing it. And I had, I was, I was hearing it for a couple days while I was having these conversations and figuring out what was going on. And then I had to hear it um, as a group. And oh, by the way, in front of my peers, my fellow presidents, because our CEO wanted to make sure the other presidents of the brands understood what can happen. And, um, and so I simply said to them, to be clear legally, <laughs> while we had the right and to the to the decimal, to the period we had the right. Um, while we had the right, just because you can do something does not mean you should. And we did not handle it the right way. And I said, let me be clear, 
This is exactly the type of product and business that we will be leaning into in the future. Like I had to be clear, we will do more of this, but because we did not handle it properly, because you were told one thing and what showed up was another, the only option is to pull back. And oh, by the way, contractually, I can't just make it disappear from Costco. It is going to take months for it to disappear. I have to unwind inventory, we have to buy out of things. And so what we're going to do during that time is measure and learn and interview and see if it really does have the impact on your business that, oh, by the way, I know it's not going to have, but that you're scared it's going to have. And so we also used it as a learning opportunity. And so I think it was this balance of why am I making this decision? Because we didn't handle it correctly. And up front in your face, we are going to do more of this, but we're going to do it better. And that I think created some bumpers in the bowling alley of understanding and expectation that when I did come back with not only more grocery and more retail, but QSR and Burger King, um, they were reminded that while this business is nothing without you, the business is nothing without franchisees, you don't own the brand. The franchisor owns the brand, but we have to, this is an ecosystem that we're building together. So that, that tension, which I think is, I, I have had this conversation with several founders that I advise in the last two days, this tension between leading and directing and collaborating. And when you take inputs uh, and when it's time to make a decision and just being clear of why you're making the decisions that you are with what input or despite certain input and not only in a way that makes the best decision you can for the moment, but that leaves the thumbprint, the culture print of how we're gonna work together in the future is uh, like a major muscle to build in leadership. I, I wanna come back to leadership and decision-making, but before we get too far away from some of these things, uh, how did Costco respond? Oh, they know likey. <laughs> um, I remember the salesperson who sold it into Costco, who probably pushed the boundaries of what he could and should have committed to them, came back and said, they will, they will never do business with us again. Um, they had just done uh, a key executive um, session where the CEO of Costco named three brands he was most excited about having, and Cinnabon was one of them. This was one month before we pulled it. We were selling 70, 000, over 70,000 units a week, which is massive velocity. That's huge, yeah. And out of only, what, 400, little over 400 units. No one was happy. <laughs> um, and and it, took, it took seven years before we were able to get back into Costco. And it wasn't even in that section of the store because the guy who ran bakery was like, look, this is Costco wants the real thing. And we kept proposing these smaller alternatives, like a taste of Cinnabon. And to his credit, he said, that's not what people want from Costco. They want the real thing. It's a treasure hunt that we're, we're a bakery. We're strong bakers and they absolutely could execute it with quality. But if we can't get the real thing, which is very close to what the franchisees sell, we don't want it. So we just didn't pursue that opportunity. I mean, Cinnabon is today the largest omni-channel restaurant business in the world. So we did okay <laughs> um, without that in other channels, but it was a shame you know, that we couldn't find a way to put a version of the product in such a world-class um, club retailer. Talk to me about the tension between sort of the franchisees and then the omni-channel presence and mm. the perceived threats and the, the benefits that um, to us looking from the outside in, we never think about. <laughs> it's so interesting. I mean, one at Focus Brands, that second executive role I had at Focus as group president was to literally build a team and a business that did nothing but omni-channel retail business outside of franchising, which is not only unusual in restaurants and franchising, you could also argue at the time would be considered heresy because you're a franchise business. What are you doing selling versions of the branded product in any other channel? Many franchisees don't even like another franchisee opening around the corner, much less the branded product being in another channel. Um, and, and as a result, there are very real tensions, but focus 
um, brands, you know, at Focus, we figured out the magic sauce. And it is very difficult to do. It is equal parts art and science because the tension is this perception of a misalignment of incentives. And if we are aligned in building sales together because franchisors make their money in most cases, you know, off of a percentage of the top line, in some cases also off product revenue, we are more top line driven, that if your goal is to optimize top line sales of franchisees, the question they ask is how could you possibly be doing that if you are creating alternative sales channels? And the obvious answer is that those sales channels are either A, incremental and not subtracting from that business, or B, may have some rare and occasional and occasional uh, cannibalization, but have such a rising tide lifts all boats effect because of the brand building activity that it more than compensates for it. And the reality is that, you know, the first is more often true, that these channels are completely separate of each other. Someone's impulse in a mall or an airport is not compromised by if they buy Cinnabon cereal at the grocery store. But I, I learned to deeply respect the emotional element of that tension. And it is more emotion than it is fact. And so part of the way to navigate that tension is to honor the emotion, to respect it, and yes, to show up with research and data and facts that evidences the incrementality of the channels. But more importantly than anything is to just put your money where your mouth is. And if it's supposed to build the brand, then it needs to be building the brand to the point that they don't have a lot to complain about because their core business is doing incredibly well. And while a franchisee even if their core business is doing well in an omni-channel brand, like what Cinnabon became, someone will always say, yeah, we're doing well, but we could be doing better, you know, if you didn't have Cinnabon coffee at Publix. Um, but most of them don't. Most of them, when the brand is doing well, given the competitive landscape and seeing how much branding and marketing happens as a result of these alternative channels, are smart enough business people to realize that is a level of um, awareness that drives trial that the franchise business alone would likely not be able to accomplish. And we started connecting the dots of the ecosystem while getting smarter and smarter about communication and checks and balances and pricing psychology uh, and retail partners. And, and then eventually talking about the brand, not as a franchise business that had some grocery products, but as a branded ecosystem of which the franchise business is the heart and then there are these concentric rings out of retail channels that provide versions of the core product and very different points in their life that are complementary to uh, the occasions of the core franchise business. I, I think that's really interesting, right? Because you did this during the financial crisis too. So it was even heightened from a franchisee point of view because their livelihoods at stake and those stores, I would imagine, are super profitable at a, a given volume of business. And That's then right. it quickly diminished. Like, like, what is the point where they start minting money as a franchisee on a volume basis? I mean, with Cinnabon, that number was 400,000 a year. You know, once they cross that, I mean, you're absolutely right. You Once you pr pass break even, because your cost of goods are so low, your, your labor is relatively limited and managed. They print money on, on a percentage basis. They print money, Auntie Anne's even more so because the cost of goods are even lower. It's like flour and water, and salt and butter. Um, but you, for Cinnabon, you get in that 400, 375, $400,000 range and you're just printing money. Auntie Anne's, I mean, you start becoming a money factory at 300,000, 275. I mean, all of that is relative to the rent, of course, because they, they were pre right. predominantly in malls and those rents tend to be on the 20% of sales side versus street side, eight to 10 rent factor. And so, you know, it all evens out in the end. Uh, and there are reasons for that footprint strategy and you, it's an infrequent purchase. So you need a lot of unique feet and these capture traffic venues that cost a lot of money, bring you those unique feet. Um, but they really are incredibly profitable small businesses to own and operate. When I walk by a Cinnabon in a mall back, you know, when people went to malls, uh, you could <laughs> smell it baking. Is that mm -hmm. intentional? It wasn't at first. Greg Komen, who is the co-founder of Cinnabon, a father-son duo, founded Cinnabon in Seattle, Washington. And he, I loved him hearing him tell the story 
that when they first opened Cinnabon and SeaTac Mall in Washington, it was such a tiny space and there was no back of house, like literally even the sinks, it was just a giant box. So the fact that you're fresh baking all day, opening the oven, think about what happens when you bake in your home. Your whole house smells like whatever you're cooking. The yeah. same is true, but you're literally opening that oven all day long. So the first location had an unbelievable amount of sales. And then the second location, they thought, well, we're, we're bigger now, we're better, we've learned, we can afford better real estate, let's put the ovens in the back. And when they put the ovens in the back, sales dropped by, I think the number was 50%. And it was simply the fact that the ovens are in the front that gets the aroma out there. Yeah, it totally. We, we have a local bakery just around the corner. And I've been trying to tell them when you bake the croissants, just vent that smell to everybody <laughs> walking by and you will instantly like double your business. Yeah, people love it. Talk to me about the psychology of pricing. I think at first, the psychology of pricing is rooted in a, a really important choice. Are you going into the value commodity game? And if so, it really is a race to the bottom because you're competing on price and not quality. Or are you mm -hmm. choosing to be more on the aspirational or luxury end of your segment? And even though some people might think, well, I wouldn't consider Cinnabon luxury. I mean, look, Cinnabon's not LVMH, but relative to donuts and baked goods and any of those, it is absolutely luxurious. It's enormous, it's expensive, it's complicated to make, it's made from scratch. Um, and so where you choose to play as a business has a lot to do. It is the important first choice uh, from a brand perspective uh, in pricing psychology. And then there is this sweet spot, this range of pricing in whatever space you're choosing to be in um, that will optimize trial and repeat. And if something is super highly priced, it could get unintentionally relegated to being a gift. And if you are, if you are building a gifting company, that's okay. But if it's food, beverage, consumption, and you, you need frequency, you need volume, then there is a certain price at which you're literally taking yourself out of the game. But there's also probably a broader range than people realize if you want to protect premium pricing. And then there's pricing psychology of beyond the thing bundles, subscription, you know, what are the other ways that you create value for those who want to lean in to your product or service? And those are some really interesting levers to pull, but it all starts with brand positioning. Like what does the brand stand for? What is it about? And where are the bumpers in the bowling alley? Like where are the guardrails for if you cross it, if you jump the shark, you're literally competing with completely different businesses. How, how would you test a price increase like at, at Cinnabon? Like, would you take one franchisee and <laughs> test it? Would you just do it nationwide? Like, how does that come to fruition from thinking about it and knowing that it's possible to we're all paying more? In the early days, it was far more scrappy <laughs> um, than than when I left, because now you know, businesses, even franchise and restaurant businesses have so much more access to technology and more sales every day are, are digital. And so you just have different mechanisms to A-B test, um, mm. different dynamics. And so I'll, I'll at, least, at least honor what it was like before. <laughs> that was true because you're talking a physical menu board with a franchisee in random markets. And oh, by the way, in franchising in the United States, in most cases, it is illegal to mandate pricing. Like you, you can give them guidance. You can say, this is the range that is right for the brand. And certainly if a franchisee makes a decision, including pricing, that is harmful to the brand, then you have a lot of rights to respond. But there's a lot of room to do damage before it's like legally harmful to the brand. And part of the thing that I inherited when I took over Cinnabon in the recession is a lot of the franchisees, as small business people do, struggling with foot traffic and transactions raised prices. And the faster you raise price, the faster you accelerate a reduction in transactions, like the curve, you know, they, they go like this. And, um, and so testing in those early days was about managing the extremes. 
more than it was optimizing and being scientific. It's like at a certain point, it is obvious that your sales drop. And at a certain point on the low end, you're positioning the brand is too cheap and you're leaving money on the table that you shouldn't. And so, um, you know, as unsophisticated as it sounds, that was the reality in those days. You're just trying to keep people from being too low and too high. And then for the franchisees that have a lot of locations, you try to work with them to get more scientific and specific, learn from them, and then share that expertise with the other franchisees. Managing, optimizing sales and frequency while also optimizing margin and profitability for the franchisees. And an example is I remember um, we clearly, the franchisees had taken up price so much. I mean, $5 for a giant cinnamon roll in the recession is exorbitant. And it was becoming difficult for me to tell what was affecting sales more, the recession or the inflated prices. And it was obvious we needed an entry level price point item. We needed something that either allowed people who no longer considered us viable for pricing reasons to occasionally try, and we needed something that was cheap enough, you know, inexpensive enough that they would want to add on a drink because we saw drink sales disappear. Often happens in snack businesses during times of crisis, difficult times. And so that also causes, even though the price of the single thing goes up, the check average is still down because you're not getting the add-on. And and so I remember going in and saying, after a lot of research and some really funny stories of other things that were in the works to help the business, uh, it was apparent that we needed to launch nationally a smaller cinnamon roll that a few of the stores had carried for a while, but was not national. And when I went to the franchisees and said, we need to offer a tiny cinnamon roll that's half the price, we need a $2.50 cinnamon roll. While that still protected the margin per ounce, they were, it was still just as profitable per ounce, there was massive resistance to adding a smaller, less expensive item to the menu. Even though it was obvi- like so obviously from a marketing perspective what was needed for, for not only price reasons, but caloric reasons, giving people more permission to indulge, it was smaller, and the franchisees were afraid of trade down. They, lit- they said, why would I put a $2.50 thing on my menu when I'm barely making it with a $5 thing on my menu? And, and when you're on the outside, the answer is also obvious. I have an answer to that question. Why should I sell a cheaper thing? Because the universe of people who want the big expensive thing is shrinking. And the universe of people who would buy and buy again a smaller, less expensive thing is growing. And so go to where the puck is going, launch the smaller thing. We're keeping the same ingredients. You have no inventory risk. It's a little bit of labor risk and a little bit of product waste risk if you don't sell it. Um, But we even figured out a way to manage that. But they were so afraid. Their top line was, it was like a their roof caving in on them. And I'm coming in saying, we need to go tell people about the roof. You know, it just, it was very difficult. And so I, that experience in particular really helped me hone the muscle of how to get people to change even when they don't want to. How, how did you not get insulated from your core customer? I mean, it, I would imagine this happens with a lot of brands, right? You sit in head office and you're distanced from the customer, you're distanced from the transaction, you uh, have a hard time relating to them and you have this persona of them in your head, but you know, $5 for you is, is you're probably not thinking about it the same way that some of your customers do. How do you get, how do you deal with reality? How do you think about getting close to your customer and not losing touch with the territory and only looking at sort of spreadsheets or numbers and, and mm-hmm. distancing yourself from that? It is a staying close to the customer is a well-documented obsession <laughs> of mine. Um, and so there are pretty simple ways to do it, even more now with the technology that's in place to communicate with customers. And especially if you have an owned channel where you have a relationship with them, you know, app, loyalty program, digital connection. But but before that, when, when Cinnabon didn't have those things as a new president, um, getting close to the customer is not only about staying close to the customer. So think focus groups, literally going to talk to them, I mean, it's not hard to listen to customers at scale. It's even easier to do that at scale now. Um, But the other piece of that equation is you also need to hear from the employees 
who interact with the customers the most. And it is those two things together that paint the most accurate picture. Because customers, we as customers, don't always articulate uh, our beliefs in a way that's consistent with our behaviors. And there are no shortage of examples. You know, we say we want to eat healthy all the time. I don't eat healthy all the time. I really want to, and that's what I'm gonna tell a company I want from them. But I'm also going to have ice cream, you know, when I want it. Um, and so, so understanding that the full perspective of what the customer wants and needs and staying close to it regularly is only formed when I talk to both the customer and the employees who most regularly interact with them. And I have three questions that I ask over and over and over. I've done it for 20 years. Started doing this in new store openings, honed it as I started leading teams, really leaned into it when I took over Cinnabon and then as we acquired brands at Focus Brands. And the three questions are um, one, what do we throw away? Which is another way of saying, what should we stop doing? Like, what are we investing time, money, and energy on? What are we giving you? What are we making you buy? Either as a franchisee, as an employee, or as a customer, that is not adding value. And if you ask enough people that exact same question in a short amount of time, patterns definitely emerge. And the reason I ask that question first is, is because in many cases, unlike the brands I invest in and advise now that are venture backed and have really strong balance sheets, in these days, you know, these are very profitable businesses from day one. And if you don't have money, you don't spend it. Like they're, it's just the nature yeah. of these businesses. And so that question has to be asked first because it's about finding money and finding resource and finding time and energy in order to support what is the answer to the next question, which is the opposite. And that is, when do we say no? When do we say no to you, the customer? Employees, when are you saying no to the customer? And employees, when do we say no to you? If we're saying no regularly, if you go, go under the surface of that, people are expecting us to have or do something for some reason, probably because the market is shaping the expectation. Said another way, the competition. And if we're regularly saying no, it is likely a smoke signal of an opportunity that we're missing. It's either a problem we need to address or an unmet need, desire, or opportunity. So question one is what can we stop doing? Like what do we throw away? What do we make you do or take that you don't use? And the second question is when do we say no? What are you asking us for that we're not doing? And rooted in the customer and the employee experience, that's what can we start doing that would add value. So what can I remove that's not gonna hurt the business when I remove it? And it might even help the business. And what can I start doing that is predisposed to making an impact because of the person who's t the people who are telling me this? And then the third question is simply, if you were me, tell me one thing you would do differently to make the business better. And there are patterns in those answers as well. And when I put all of that together in a cauldron, <laughs> it, it magically creates what tends up being a relatively accurate set of priorities for the business in the short term. And then I have to connect that to where we're taking the business long term. So let's make that real. I mean, the first 30, 30 days as president at Cinnabon, you mm -hmm. talked up your hair, you went in the store and mm -hmm. you, you started working there. What did you yeah. learn through those questions? How did that change <laughs> your your first like 100 days? And, and how did it guide you? And what did you find out? I. Um, yeah, I did nothing but work in the bakeries for 60 days. And I mean, I hired a few people. I fired a person who needed to be let go. I had some meetings. But other than that, I was in airports, in malls, taking out trash, rolling cinnamon rolls, hours at a time in a store, not shaking hands, kissing babies, showing up to be seen, like working alongside people enough time for the facade to sort of fade away and to really see what they're experiencing and to have quality conversations. And when I asked, what do we throw away? There were two answers, two buckets of patterns. One had to do with a lot of employee training materials and uniform items and just things the company still had on their checklist as a franchise that were in a bucket, but when the auditor would come show up, they would pull it all out and act as if they were using it. So we were making franchisees buy, do, and use things that were not relevant to the business anymore. They had been a few years prior. Um, and it, implementing technological solutions for training would end up being the answer for that. But the other one was people buy these giant cinnamon rolls 
and then they're throwing it away. Like they're, they're, they're either taking it home or they're not finishing it. And that directly correlated with the answer to the second question. When do we say no? We say no when people ask us for smaller portions. Right. And it, when you find something that is a pattern across all three questions, I have learned you stop everything, everything, and you make that happen right away. And so when I said, um, what do people throw away? Like, what are we making you do that's not always adding value? Only having this giant size. What should we start doing? Their, their answer thematically was smaller portions. Then if you were me, what's one thing you would do differently to make the business better? Give us more snackable, more portable. I, like you put all that together and it's like, why are we doing anything else? Why are we doing right. anything else at all? And we stopped everything, which made some of the team members very upset. But it was so clear that if I, I would have failed, I would be failing the company if I didn't put a stop to these other things that had nowhere near the likelihood of maybe not positively transforming the business, but at least stopping the leaky bucket. <laughs> like the first way to get out of a hole is to stop digging. Like let's, let's give the people what they want, um, a smaller portion. Let's figure out how to do that profitably. And, and that platform, the smaller cinnamon roll, um, being introduced despite the resistance because of the fear of trade down. I mean, that was the hard part for me. It was, it was the answer that was so obvious that was met with the greatest emotional resistance. And it was that I just, it was very clear. It is worth it to take the verbal beatings and have the debates and get people to change even though they don't want to by confronting reality. So what's going on in the market and what happens Offense and defense, you know, what happens if we do this, the positive, and what happens if we don't do this, a continued negative trend. Um, find the coalition of the willing. So who are the people already doing it who already believe and really lean into them being a part of architecting what this looks like and then shining a light on them and letting them tell the story to roll it out and rinse and repeat. That is my change formula for rolling out anything that is unpopular. I, I like that a lot. How did you establish the trust to go into these franchise locations and get an accurate view? I remember, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. I used to work at Staples and our, uh, you know, district manager would come and the store would be remarkably way cleaner than if the <laughs> district manager was not coming. I mean, we would have overtime, extra shifts, there'd be extra staff. It Always. was not representative of reality. Yeah. How did you yeah. establish that that you could go into these locations because you weren't undercover? You were, you sort of went mm -hmm. in as yourself and, and get get the truth. I mean, at first, I encountered exactly what you described: new president, everything's clean, ridiculously staffed. You know, like what are these people doing? <laughs> There's not even enough. There are no. There are more employees than customers. I just don't understand. <laughs> And the, part of the trick of breaking through that is how long I would stay, right? That works when someone's visiting, doing a checklist, shaking hands and leaving. If I'm staying for four or five hours, it becomes very clear that those people have nothing to do. <laughs> and, and then it gives me the opportunity to not criticize, not think they're bad people for trying to put their best foot forward. I mean, you just described it at your role at Staples and anyone who's worked in service or hospitality or retail probably has had this experience and not judging them for that. And, and then maybe I would bring up like, wow, your labor's high. I think I know why, if this is the way you staff the business. <laughs> and then they'd say, oh, well, we don't usually have this many people. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and and so I think this approach of non-judgment, unless they're breaking a law, harming a person, there's no judge, like you're doing what you've been doing, built on beliefs you have that I can't undo. All I can do is start a new pattern of experiences. And even when I encounter things I don't approve of or like, um, back to this, it's not about the event, it's about the event after the event. Like what's the cultural thumbprint when I leave? how I handle issues that need to be addressed, how I handle natural power dynamics at play with managers and employees can actually help shift that 
those belief systems over time. But I can't tell them that. I can't tell them and expect them to believe it. I have to give them experiences that alter their beliefs, that change the way they behave, that get us to a different place. And then I just had to outright have conversations with regional managers and district managers to at least say, look, I don't know what you've experienced in the past. I don't know if when leaders have come to the stores, if they've shaken hands and kissed babies, if they've worked, if they've not come at all. I don't know if that's been a good thing or a bad thing. So I'm just going to literally give you the words of why I'm here, what I'm doing, what I hope to accomplish, and my commitment of how I'm going to handle seeing the inevitable, um, which is things that need to be addressed. I will use it for good and not evil. So I would say that proactively with middle management so they didn't feel I was working around them, and then back it up with how I behaved. And that helps and, over time. And because you had the tr they weren't going to get in trouble based That's on right. what you heard unless it was within those caveats. Yeah. Yeah. There's, really, there's two points in your career that I sort of want to double click on and explore a little more. One was sort of, you, you mentioned this uh, way back in the conversation, but you're working with a group of people, you care about certain things. The next day you're leading that group of people and the things you care about are different. I'm wondering what advice you would give somebody who, who sort of like takes over a team that they, they were a part of mm -hmm. uh, and how you sort of think about that transition um, and going from being a part of a team to leading the team that you were a part of the day before. The how is to still first remember it's all about the customer. And it is always more important to do the right thing than to be right. And I have found the times when I was on the other side, where I was the employee on the team and someone else on the team was promoted to take over, that sometimes you could call it a power trip or a power struggle, or all of a sudden people feel that they're literally a completely different human or they have to be. They're now the boss and they're no longer an extension of the workforce. And so for the how, my tip is keep it about the customer. It is not about you. It is not about being a boss. It is about optimizing the customer experience through the team, removing their hurdles, holding them accountable, helping them have what they need to do a good job, and connecting them to the why of the business. And when you get called out, which I did, I remember the first time I became shift lead in the restaurant, and I was telling one of the fellow waitresses she had not properly filled up her salt and pepper shakers. And she looked at me and said, well, you didn't do that consistently. Just sign my paper and let me go home. And it was this fork in the road. I'm like, oh, am I gonna be cool? And be like, yeah, girl, you're right, you know, go ahead. Or, or am I gonna hold the standard and acknowledge that I didn't always do it the right way? And I, I remember her, she was very forceful. <laughs> she was not happy that I was not letting her go home because that was gonna take an extra 10 minutes. And I said, look, you're right. I didn't always do it the right way. I will now going forward and you have to now as well. That was it, like the, there are just these moments. There are these little forks in the road where we're tested. And so keeping it about the customer and then via, via the customer focus, making it about the team having what they need. And if and when you're called out on an imperfection, um, acknowledge it. You're right, here's what I'm doing about it. Here's why it's important, let's go get it done. And that over time, people start to respect that you don't, you're not suggesting that because you're now in a leadership role that you are better than. You simply are in the role and you want to do a really good job in the role. I think that's one of the things that holds people back at those transition moments. They, they still want to be one of the team and, and not necessarily the leader, which is what the job the customer probably needs done in, to use your language. And so you're trying to play both sides of it and you actually lose, lose both ways. Uh, one of the things that you said there that was interesting, that it was more important to do right than be right. Can you elaborate on that and give me some examples? I, when I was in Argentina uh, with Hooters, I was 19 and it was only the second opening I had led fully. And I get down to Buenos Aires and of course the franchisee had gone through training and we had a menu and specifications and equipment 
that they were supposed to have for the business. And I, I get down there and they had done everything we told them, bought all the kitchen equipment, almost identical menu as in the US. And as we started training the cooks, it became apparent that there was a problem. They were um, disgruntled. They were saying, you know, like, this food is bad and I can't believe we have to do this. And at first I was like, what's going on? And then I realized by talking to the cooks and the trainers that we had brought down that Argentina, I would then learn, is the beef capital, one of the beef capitals of the world. And we had an embarrassingly low quality ribeye steak sandwich that we were requiring them to cook on a flat top grill, which was an abomination in Argentina. In the US, if you want a steak sandwich, you take a ribeye, you slap it on a flat top grill, a little bit of olive oil, sear it, how do you want it cooked? Medium, medium well, put it on your Texas toast sandwich with some cheese and onions, and there you go. It, it, was, it was so viewed as so low quality that it was insulting there. Not only the choice of the, the beef, which should have been alternatively hyper local source to be of the quality that is expected even in casual dining there, Right. It was the equipment. It was that it wasn't on open flame. And I remember that fork in the road where I thought, what do I do? I'm here representing the company. These are the franchise standards. They clearly signed up for it. They bought it. It's here. Do I just toe the line and say, nope, sorry. This is the menu. Get over it. Or do I listen and take that feedback and make a decision to change. Oh, by the way, this is before iPhones were really prominent. And I think I had a pager at that point and we were still using fax to communicate any changes. So it was very difficult for me to communicate with the corporate office. And so I didn't have the permission or the experience with such a situation to know exactly what I should do. But I sat down with the franchisee and I said, um, here's all the criticism that I'm getting and it is voluminous and there is a pattern. It's not one-offs. There were many other things like having beans on the menu. Baked beans are really popular in the US. At that time, it was considered a poor person's food, a pauper's food in Argentina. And if it was on the menu, it meant you were a lower grade restaurant. And so there were many of these situations that were clearly the result, now I can say, of us not having deep local cultural knowledge. Um, but I wasn't sure what I was empowered to do or not to do. These are menu items on a global restaurant chain's menu. And so I talked to him about it. I was very honest about the struggle that I'm hearing it. I believe it. I wanna do something about it. I understand it has financial implications and I don't even know if it's going to be approved. And he looked at me and he said, anytime, it's one of my favorite pieces of advice. Anytime you are criticized, assume first it's correct. Just allow yourself to digest that and then respond. And either you will you will reaffirm that the criticism is not correct and you can focus more on the why and a productive relationship, or you realize there's at least some grain of truth and you will work intensely to address that issue. And it was so helpful and so inspiring because the right thing to do, and the question is for whom, the right thing to do for the customer and the employees, not necessarily the head of marketing of Hooters restaurants at the time, who probably would have said no if I had asked, the right thing to do for the right people, the right stakeholders was to make the change, was to get in a new piece of equipment that was a flame, you know, an open flame piece of equipment on which to cook meat, allow the franchisee to help us locally source better cuts of meat, make some changes, take beans off the menu, do a few things differently, reprint the menus <laughs> and open with that new menu. And that's what we did. Is there an example where you ever did that and you got in trouble after? Oh, I got in trouble for that. <laughs> um, I remember talking to the head of purchasing. The head of marketing actually got it. I thought he was going to be very uh, frustrated by it, but he was incredibly supportive. The head of training, she was incredibly supportive. She understood. But the head of supply chain and purchasing who managed the food specs was not happy. Um, he let me know that that was not my job, um, that I was out of line, that this is not, I do not own this brand and do not have the right to make these changes. And um, 
What made me feel good is it was two to one, two executives to one <laughs> were supportive, but it, it did make me nervous. You know, I'm a 20 year old down in another country opening a franchise of a business that I don't own with a man who's been in business longer than I've been alive telling me I'm doing a bad job. Um, and I just, I mean, it, it made me teary, you know, it like, I'm a young employee and I thought I was doing the right thing. And I had some reinforcement from some executives, but the one who's like approving the specification sheet and who, by the way, when I come back to the U S I need to keep working with, <laughs> um, was angry, was audibly angry. And, um, luckily I leaned on the vice president of training. Her name's Cheryl. And I remember calling her and I was upset and I felt comfortable being upset with her. And I was like, I'm so sorry. You know, I thought I was doing the right thing. I know you support it, but this other executive is really upset and I don't know what to do because I can't, I'm down, I'm down here. You guys aren't, I can't undo this decision that I still think is the right decision. And just, you know, allies and advocates and mentors and all the words you want to use are so important. She said, don't worry. He's just crotchety. He'll get over it. You're doing the best you can. We'll get better at this as we do more of it. And it was her support, her encouragement, her maturity. And oh, by the way, she ended up going into his office and saying, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, you know, what, what's the alternative? And so she was an advocate. The company was growing and I was caught in the crosshairs of the company growing faster than it was ready to grow um, and having those human centered executives can really keep top employees kind of in the game, despite the fact that they're causing friction. And because I was the one going into these countries, I was known for friction. <laughs> I was constantly having to change menu items have, you know, I got to the point where after I did it enough, I was mature enough to go look, you guys need to be better at this, right? I'm down here yeah. dealing with this reactively. And then when I became an executive at 26, now running these departments, I had the drive and the the mission to get much, much better proactively as a result. You've said in the past, chaos is your jam. Uh, talk <laughs> to me about leading with a heavy heart while navigating through tough times. There's There's a balance. I mean, I think first we have to look out for ourselves. You know, the whole put your oxygen mask on first is an important reminder. That is a little tougher for the ultimate leader to navigate because when you look over your shoulder, there's not a lot of other people there who can do what you do. Um, at the same time, all these terms we're hearing more of, you know, self-care and um, mental health and physical wellness, like these things are the foundation of being able to lead when we are called to lead at exceptional times of change and difficulty. And so that's just a plug for take care of yourself as best as you can when you can, because you want to be there as strong as you can be for that rainy day. Um, and then on top of taking care of myself and making the decision when there's a tough moment or a tough season um, or tough seasons, you know, in a company or someone's personal life, first being in the game is a choice. Sometimes I need to take myself out of the game for a moment. And, and what makes that easier is having a great team, being able to lean on them. And I remember I've, I've written about this and um, I'm always so happy to talk about it. But when I, I was an executive at Focus Brands, um, president and COO of the company and just had a lot of back-to-back -back travel. I had a keynote I was doing for a company. Um, we were in peak diligence for an acquisition to take a public company private. I was um, pregnant. Um, I had already had one child. I was now pregnant a second time and had a miscarriage while I was traveling. And, and I had a keynote the next day. And so I went through this and, and then a big meeting in another city 24 hours after that keynote. And so it was like four flights in 24 hours or 36 hours. And I remember asking myself some questions. One, am I physically okay? Right, that's first. And if not, I need to go to a hospital or a doctor. Um, and I, re I, I knew what was happening. It was not my first miscarriage. I was physically okay. 
So I, you know, that was for, if not, all bets are off. I need to make sure I'm physically okay. I was physically okay. I knew what was happening. I called the doctor. I talked to my husband. I'm physically okay. Am I emotionally okay? Not really, but I will be. Like just that I'm not okay, but I will be. And then the more tactical question, will it be a positive experience? Is it right for me to keep calm and carry on, right? To do the speech the next day and go to the meeting. That is a very personal decision for which there should be no judgment. And my decision was that if I'm physically okay, I'm emotionally struggling, but I talked to my husband, I'm feeling better. And I, I know because I've been through this, I will be. It's gonna make me feel good to feel normal for a minute and give a speech. And so I decided to give the speech. I cried on most of the flight from that city to the next cities uh, for the meeting. And I had a cocktail, um, a cocktail appointment that night with coworkers. And I just sent them a text and said, just got in, not feeling great. You guys go ahead without me. I'll see you in the morning. And that was this example of in one case, I chose to put myself in the game. In the other instance, to manage what was a natural, emotional, intellectual processing of this, I chose to take myself out of the game. And then the next morning, um, one of them pinged me. I mean, again, the power of having a great team. Hey, how are you feeling? Do you want us to start the meeting without you? And I said, why don't you guys go ahead? I'll join, you know, a few minutes, a few minutes late. But just that feeling of I was able to tell them something going on, but not all the information I wasn't comfortable with sharing and giving them the opportunity to step up to support me, whether I needed it, wanted it or not, it gave them that opportunity. And these decisions of taking ourselves in, putting ourselves in the game or taking ourselves out for a moment, and then communicating with our team so that they can offer whatever help or support they can uh, provide is a part of the secret sauce of navigating, whether it's your own difficult moment or it's a macro difficult moment, whatever's going on in the world at the time, this muscle of am I in or am I out for this moment? Am I physically okay? Am I emotionally okay? As a result, am I in or am I out? If I'm out, what do I need? If I'm in, what do I need? And realizing that's always a decision. And then I have become very comfortable with being incredibly open uh, and vulnerable. And as a result, I think my team reciprocates that openness and it allows us opportunities to offer help for each other to even say, I know you wouldn't take yourself out of the game or out of this meeting, but it's actually no big deal if you do. You know, just those, those permissions to let us be, let us live where it feels like this living, breathing, um, you know, organism uh, in terms of the team dynamics is incredibly powerful. And then we can give things the energy that they need. I like that a lot. You mentioned your husband. One of the things that you guys do is, are these monthly check-ins. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about those and what kind of questions you ask each other. So we, when we first met, we were both out of long-term relationships. He was out of his last one for about a year. I was out of mine for about six months. Neither of us were planning on finding romance, um, long-term uh, commitment. And we met each other and you know it was pretty instant. And because we very quickly appreciated what we had found in each other, we both acknowledged that in our previous relationships, even though we were so happy they didn't work out because we found each other, that we actually had a role in the devolution, that's a word, mm -hmm. um, of our previous relationships. And that I couldn't remember in my previous long-term relationship ever saying or thinking, I want to be a great partner. I remember thinking, I wanna be a great human, I want to be an awesome leader. I want to be a great business person. And I'm really happy with this person. I don't remember ever prioritizing my role as partner at home in an intentional way. And, and my husband said that my now husband said the same thing. And, and we both quickly came to the conclusion that we want to be different this time. And we want to be as good, if not better at home as that we are in business. And so then the question was, well, how do you do that? And the answer was intentionality. And he had read an article about a couple that had a tradition of having champagne on their month anniversary, no matter where they were in the world. And that was the inspiration for doing something on our month anniversary, uh, the 10th of every month. 
and and then I had been a part of YPO and these other sort of executive groups that had some really um, well researched, highly effective conversational techniques to bring out the best in equals, you know, in in high performing groups. And so we blended those things and came up with a check in that we do on the 10th of every month, no matter what, even if we're apart, we'll do it virtually. And we ask each other a series of questions uh, back and forth. The first question is, what's been the best part of the last 30 days? And, And the answers need to be related to the relationship. If they affect the relationship, but are about work or something else, that's okay. It's just what affects us. Um, So what's been the best part of the last 30 days? That affects us. What's been the worst part of the last 30 days? What is one thing I can do differently to be a better partner for you? And within that one thing, it's sort of like my three questions, but uh, for business, what's something I should stop? What's one thing I could start or something that you really wanna make sure I continue? Next is what what has worried you the most related to our relationship in the last 30 days? What have you been the most grateful for? What are you most proud of? And then we'll typically ask a question about goals related to the family. And that is every month. We do a little tiny version every week that's a bit more tactical, functional, schedule oriented. But that discussion of asking each other with a desire to go deep and a challenge to the other person if they're being on the surface, like the last part of the, the best part of the last 30 days is just being with you, right? You can't get away with that. You have to. It's why the questions are what they are. They force the extremes. And something can be the worst and not be that bad, right? It's just the worst. Um, And so we have done this every month since we met. Um, It has been an incredible enabler to our relationship. Um, We've shared it with friends who've also said it's been life-changing, which feels hyperbolic, but I know that it's not. Uh, for their relationship and and then reverse engineered it to have a similar practice for my business. It it was rooted in one-on-ones that I already had with my team, but my one-on-ones with my team got better as my check-ins with my husband became more refined and consistent. What are the questions you ask in your one-on-ones with your team? Very similar to those questions. Um, But I dig into the question, tell me one thing I could do differently to be a better partner or leader for you. I, I do break it into those parts. So right. you must give me something to stop and you must give me something to start and you must tell me something we should continue. That That's a nuance where if we feel that we're stuck in our personal check-in at home, we'll, we'll break it into those parts. If we don't feel like we're getting to something actionable, but in the business context, because there are power dynamics at play that are very different, forcing it into that um, seems to produce far more candor. Yeah, definitely. Um, is there a particular bit of feedback that you've received from your husband that was hard for you that you'd be willing to share and completely understand mm. if you, you don't want to do that? No, no, no. I have to. There's Most of it hasn't been hard, but I, I, I want to think of one that has been more emotional. I mean, I remember after the second miscarriage and in our check-in it became apparent that i had been acting as if it was much much worse for me than it was for him Mm -hmm. and and not that he was saying it was as hard or harder on him it was just apparent he made it clear that my processing was different than his processing and that he was much more devastated than I had realized. Because he talked about when we asked the, what's been the worst part of the last 30 days, it was all he would talk about. The thoughts, the what ifs, the, and I, he didn't say, you've been belittling my grieving, right? He didn't say that. It was apparent to me that his what was lasting, right? It's like whatever shows up at the end of the 30 days, and we do review the calendar because it's helpful. The 30 days is a long time. Um, Whatever makes it to that one question is relatively momentous and actionable. And when all he talked about was that this was sad and this was difficult, and I realized that I was not 
And I didn't criticize myself for it. It was just real, you know, that I was not recognizing how he was thinking about um, and processing this loss. And it was so helpful because it allowed me to then ask questions. And I was much more sensitive and um, probing in the weeks that followed. It was really powerful. And there have been a few moments like that, that actually, the, I would say the common theme of when I'm hearing something difficult has to do with um, moments where we process something very differently and we're moving so fast in our lives. I didn't realize it until we pause to have the conversation. Do, do you respond in the same way? I think it was one of the franchisees who gave you that piece of advice. Do you just assume it's true and then operate from that? Yeah. Yeah, because the question is about what you feel. Like, how can I say that's not true? I remember once doing the check-in and I don't remember what question it was, but I answered it for my husband and he asked and I answered and he corrected me. And I said, wait a minute, this is my answer to the check-in. <laughs> this yeah. is true. And this was like just three months ago and we've been doing this for five years. So yeah. um, there is an impulse to say, I disagree. And it's like, hmm, this isn't something you get to disagree with. It is right. my answer and you have to hear it. And he, he laughed. He was like, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I think that's a, the, a great process. Um, true to form. I, I emailed you beforehand saying I could probably talk to you all day and I would never run out of questions. And I have millions of questions left, but uh, we're going to have to do a part two. I do want to <laughs> end this with a question that I, I've started asking people, I'd be interested in your take on this, which is how do you want to be remembered when you're 90? Mm. This is very easy for me. Um, I want to be remembered as, as someone who helped people realize that they're capable of more than they know. And when I say people, I mean everyone, but the priority is those I love most. Like that, that is my purpose. I want to help people realize they're capable of more than they know. And, and no one is more important in that group than my family and my closest friends. And it is what I hope is the lasting impression, the thumbprint, you know, after I'm gone, it's what I hope people are left with. And they, they get a little more creative, like the chicken wing story, or they are more open to coaching and criticism. So they grow faster. And, you know, in the way that I've shared, they realize their mistakes are just a first attempt in learning because they've heard me share my mistakes so comfortably. Um, that that trail of possibility, like the power of possible, um, that is what I hope I'm looked at as now when I'm 90 and long after I'm gone. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much for your time today, Kat. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.